My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The death of Autumn Pass is not unobserved on Broadway. There's the tolling of bells by thin, shivering fellows in white wigs and baggy Santa Claus suits. And the hands of hawkers are not so nimble and fleet, numbed with winter darkness. And from trumpets, solemn removal of derby for the passing of autumn song, and modulate, quick scream into Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer. And remember, how were the days of the falling leaf? Taste their glow, watch them flicker, watch them die. Then go search somewhere else. Only 25 more shopping days. And north on Broadway and then east, where wealth is fringed by Winter River. And the room is paneled wood gleaming in firelight, a carved desk and sheen of wine-red leather chair, and soft glow of firelight also on the face of a boy, dead of a bullet wound between the eyes, and the man over him, proud. Neat shot, wouldn't you say? Yes, yes, it was, Mr. Parker. I'd say he never knew what hit him, wouldn't you say? Ed, Eddie, please. Please. We're listening, Cora. What is it you want to tell us? Nothing. Just nothing. Frightful thing, I suppose, for a woman. You see, Mr. Clover, my wife has never looked upon death. Not at least to my knowledge. Cora, dear, is this the very first time... Just run it down for me, Mr. Parker, exactly what happened, how it happened. Quite obvious, wouldn't you say? Just tell me. Quite obvious, I would say. The open safe, the money he tried to steal, now littering my library floor where I potted him. Eddie, stop it. Why should I, dear? The man asked me. He has to know exactly how it was. That sordid little thief could have killed me if I hadn't got there first. Would you just move away from him, Mr. Parker? Of course. <laughs> how these things work out. We were off for a second little honeymoon. Cora and me. Reservations, the whole deal. Fun, sunshine, desert... The Rossmore in Palm Springs. Then word at the airport that our plane was grounded. Back here and then... Well, there's nothing on him. Loose change, pack of cigarettes, no gun, no identification. I was saying, we came back here and we sat for a while, talking. Then to bed. Cora fell asleep. I read. There was a sound on the fire escape. I got my gun. I found him here in the library with the safe open. And it was simple. Between the eyes... We'd best hit the sack, Cora. We're leaving tomorrow. Cancel it. Stick around. Look, we've Eddie. got... Eddie. Eddie, boy. You wish to add something, Cora? You liked it. You liked killing him, didn't you, Eddie, boy? A thief, dear. In my house. Well, come now. Can you think of another way? And the man named Edward Barker squared his shoulders, clasped hands behind back made glinty the eyes and stood at parade rest in a double-breasted pinstripe. A few minutes later, the men from technical made their entrance. Mr. Barker made more glinty the eyes. And I left. Home now and one flight up. The magazine story continued next month. Sleep. Life continued next day. Next day, breakfast that explodes when you pour the milk on it. Coffee and and back to headquarters. The man sitting in your office waiting for you is Detective Dennison. Morning, Danny. Hi, Dennison. Nippy out, huh? Mm, yeah. You noticed how fast Christmas is coming this year? Every year it comes fast, except the payments to the Christmas club. Those week after slow week. Yeah. You got anything for me, Dennison? Zero. No identification on the boy, huh? Nothing. Strange, too, the way he opened that safe. Clean. Real fine professional job. You'd think he had a record. Hmm? Mugovan left a notation that the boy's prince check with nothing at all we've got. So Mugovan sent him to Washington. We'll see. That's all. Huh? What you doing for Christmas, Danny? Oh, I hadn't thought of it. Yeah, this sounds real oblong, but my uh, girlfriend's got a girlfriend. Warm, sunny, southern type. She used to dance Thanks, in a... Thanks, Dennis, and I'll, I'll think about it. Turn the chair. Through steamed window, the winter city and tread wheel of crowd. And beyond, harbor and freighter... And you know it's barnacled with the coral of summer seas. And turn back into it. Begin a waiting you've known before. Wait on the identity of a boy who lies still and nameless in the morgue. And fill in the time of waiting across the street with coffee and a sandwich. Back then to headquarters. 
and corridor is swift winter twilight and the new sheaves of violence on bulletin board. And at the turn, it's Detective Dennison. I told the girl to have a seat. Wait till you got back. What girl? The girl who ran out of husband last night, all night. Looked for him all day, came here for a little... Oh, where is she? Girl with this problem, where else would she be? Morgue. Need me anymore, Danny? No. Go back. And turn into another corridor. And at the end of it, the swaying light bulb, it's yellow on the winter mist hair of a girl who sits erect on the warm bench. Miss? I was told to wait here. The man said... I asked somebody about Johnny. I don't remember who, but um, he was tall and kind of... Well, that was Detective Dennison. Uh, this, uh, Johnny... That My you... husband, Johnny Clark. I I'm Peggy Clark. Johnny said he was going out for a little walk last night, and he, he didn't come back. No? I sat up all night. Then this morning I went to where he works, and he wasn't there, and I asked somebody what to do. And... That's the morgue, isn't it? Those Through those doors? Yes. Will you take me in, please? Oh, Mrs. Clark... If Johnny's in there, I want to know about it. All right. <gasps> Johnny! <laughs> Mrs. Clark... Oh, please, don't know... May I touch my husband? I I'm going to touch you. I wish to thank you. All of you have been very considerate. Goodbye. No, wait. I could talk to you later, Mrs. Clark, at your home, wherever you... Talk? About Johnny. About why this happened to him. He was a good husband. He worked very hard. They told him at the warehouse they had their eye on him. He was killed while he was robbing a place on the East River. We live in a two-room flat, and we were saving for a house in Queens or Pelham Bay. I have a girlfriend who lives in Pelham. She has a kid. I guess I nagged Johnny about the house. Your husband never do a thing like that before. Steal, rob. Johnny and I went to movies or... Walked in a park, and I knew where he was every minute. Every minute. We lived quietly. We had a very good friend who said he'd help Johnny buy the house if only I'd stop nagging in his presence. Drove him crazy, he said. What friend? What? Well, who was the friend who was going to help you buy that house? That's Frank Gunner. A man Johnny met at lunch near where he works. He said he'd help Johnny about the house. He knew an angle. I'll just have to... Tell him it's no use. You know where I can find Frank Grunner? Mm hmm. We, we've been to his room for beer some night, Johnny and I. But it's a boarding house, 1227 East 28. I'm just going to tell him to forget about the house. No use thinking about it. May I go now? My name's... Come in, come in. Let me take your coat. Well, I... Uh... Please. All right. Now, let me look at you. Ma, you've changed. Was it awful? Huh? Yes, it must have been. And now you've come back. Uh, I'm from the police. My name's Danny Clover. Oh, I thought you sent me the pillow. This one? No, no, I didn't. So many of the boys who stayed here with me send me things. Soldiers, most of them. And, well, I, I thought you were the one that sent no, me... No, I, I want some information the about... One of them sent me a sword. See? From Japan. A real Japanese used it to... I had uh, information about Frank Grunner. I only wish he was here now. I'd show him how a real Renfrew would use this. <laughs> I'm Bessie Renfrew. I'm glad. I'm kidding. I like Frank. I wouldn't harm a hair. Let's talk about him, shall we? 
He's gone. You mean for the day? Gone. Then he's not coming back, is that it? Yesterday. Pinched my cheek. Gave me my favorite smile. Then got mean and said, Bessie, you run a flea bag boarding house and I hope we'll never meet again. <laughs> what a kidder. Where did Frank go? You'll never believe me. Yes, I will. Oh. I promise. Ruxton Plaza Hotel on Park Avenue. From Bessie Renfrews to Park Avenue like that. <laughs> See, I told you you'd never believe me. May I have my coat, Mrs. Renfrew? You poor boy. And having lived the place of brocaded pillows and samurai swords and the motherly Mrs. Renfrew, live it just a little longer. Disengage her toil-worn fingers from my overcoat sleeve and brush aside the gentle tides of gin-scented air and get out. And cross town out of Park Avenue in the Ruxton Plaza Hotel. The clerk recovers from the sight of a police badge, grasps the desk with both hands and tells you that a Mr. Frank Grunner is a newly arrived guest. That he occupies room 1212 and please, will there be no trouble, please. Walk away from him. Ride the elevator with a young woman in conversation with a Pekingese, with her hand being held by a gray-haired gentleman who talks to no one at all. Twelfth floor and down the corridor lined with framed pastel splotches and carpeted silence. And room 1212. The radio behind it plays. No one answers the door. Try it. And inside... Framed pastel, larger. Radio, jazz through white lacquer, bed occupied. The man on it was dressed in a blue satin robe. And where his initials were, F.G. between them. A knife. Laying against one hand a book, a novel. In the other hand, a corner of bedspread in anguished fold. Man in hotel room. Murdered man. Listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The light of the new November morning taps Broadway's shoulder, breaks the clinch that held it all night long. The beginning of it, the slow moments before going to work time, the gesture. Splash water in your face and get ready for this round. Then from somewhere, the warning buzzer. The faraway shriek of a whistle. Get ready to fight it. Forget the bumps of yesterday. Put a clean white shirt over them and a pretty necktie. Get out there. A new day just came out of the corner. And for me, the day began when the office lights shone on the plump head of Sergeant Gino Tartaglia. Good morning, Danny. Hi, Gino. Come on in. Oh, what have you got there? I brought them in today in case you haven't done it yet. Pick and shoes. Hmm. They're very nice, Gino. So, if you haven't bought your Christmas cards yet, I'm taking orders. My neighbor, Mrs. Renbaum, has a home hobby with a paintbrush and scissors. So I took a lot on consignment to bring to the office for all the boys to see. <laughs> I'll look at them later, Gino, if you don't mind. Any special ideas you have, Mrs. Renbaum will be glad to make up, Danny. For instance, this one, ordered by Officer Wendelkin. Read it, Danny. Hmm? To my wife. The best to you this Christmas time, darling second cousin of mine. Gino. Poems like that come to Mrs. Renbaum in flashes, Danny. Sure, work, she... Gino, please. Indeed. <clears throat> From fingerprints found on the deceased at the Ruxton Plaza Hotel, the deceased is an ex-con by the name of Frank Grunner. What kind of record? Cracked safes. Was out on a parole. Mm. For how long? About a year. Assignment to probation officer Harry Blaine. Harry, huh? Well, he'll know what Grunner's been doing since he's been out of... I think I'll take a walk down... Danny. The... Just leave the Christmas cards on my desk, Gino. And you'll give me an order? Oh, I'm sure we'll be able to work out something. Oh, man tries 
Danny does the best he knows how. Reads the books on how to be a good probation officer. Tends the lectures and bluey. Blows up, smacks him in the face. You sorry about Frank Runner? Yeah, if he was to put it that way, I'm sorry. <laughs> Ought to be accustomed to it by now. Best years of my life I spent being sorry. About Gunner, Harry. Good boy, I think. On his way to being a good boy. You want to tell me about it? A year out of state prison. Reported to me regular. Did the right things. Said the right things. Hmm. Go on. You know what he said to me? He said, Harry, you don't bother me. I can't chum with the Denimore alumni. Who needs them? What bothers me, Harry, is I can't vote. Thing like that is, is is very painful, said to me. Harry. Is Danny? Grunner was murdered. I'm sorry, Danny. I didn't mean to take up so much of your time. Grunner moved out of a flea bag into a Park Avenue hotel. Oh, Frank was a boy with taste for nice things. Are we going to hold that against him? But just tell me how he did it. Oh, he had a fine job. I arranged it for him. He's doing real fine. Good reports on him. I'm sure... Where was got... his job, Harry? Shoe salesman at Andrea's department store. Very high-class merchandise. High-class customers, too. Frank developed a knack with shoes in occupational therapy class at state prison. He's doing real fine. Thanks, Harry. Uh, you're very welcome, Danny. Another thing Frank told me. Yeah, what? He said soon he was going into business for himself. I patted him on the back for that one. I even offered it. <laughs> I'm sorry I took so much of your time, Danny. I beg your pardon. Of course. But we're for ladies, you know. Only. Our sh Police. Oh. Then Mrs. Cliff will have to wait, won't she? Off my perch. And here we are. Now. Now we'll talk about Frank Grummer. Delighted. Uh, Mr. Van. Mr. Van, take Mrs. Clip, 4 triple A, blue sandals, gold trim. You know the one. Uh, show her the one she returned last week first. She'll never know. Now, to Frank Grunner, shall we? Let's. Let's indeed. Talk about your triple A. There was one for you. There was? As a salesman, I mean. Rough, but gentle. You know. Go on. How could he miss? Oh, just tell me about him. It's something a great shoe salesman is born with. Frank Grunner had it. Many of us try... That's not what I want to know. I want to know who, who his, his customers, customers were. Yes. We'll start from there. His favorite one? All right. A toss-up. Now, look. Between you... Mrs. Barker and... Mrs. who? Mrs. Barker, Cora Barker. And Frank Grunner always waited on her? The long minutes they spent over there by the X-ray machine, she with her foot in it, he peering into the eyepiece, the giggles and the chuckles that went on there. Real friendly, huh? The amount of shoes he sold her was the talk of the city. Do you know whether he ever saw her on the outside? He was an ex-convict, you know. Yeah, I know. That's the only reason. For what? For meeting him after the store closed. For taking him home in her car. To make Frank feel that he was not unwanted. To make him know that she and we were all pulling for him. And we were. Yeah, that's the reason why she picked him up. Cora Barker is a married woman. Sir, our customers no, are... No, of course. Well, you've been a big help, thanks. That's about all I want to know. Of course. Uh, did Mr. Van fit you, Mrs. Clip? I see he did. Walk out of it. Past the knee-high mirrors. Past the reflections of misted silk. Shod and unshod. And have the vague impression that the large toe in one of them had been crooked, was beckoning you. And pull up for an instant, look back, and see the toe now peeking out of the latest thing in Peruvian lizard. Comfortable there. Then the door that opens photoelectrically onto late November Avenue. Walk it. And against a stone facade pose two names. Frank Brenner, Mrs. Cora Barker, and another, Johnny Clark first-time thief who was dead of a bullet between his eyes, had become aware of another thing, the quickening pace of the crowd, the fleet curve of November into evening, and race it to headquarters. And in your office, find the lights already turned on against swift winter night. The man who'd done it, Detective Dennison. You have a touch of color on your cheeks, Danny. Nippy out there, huh? Mm, yeah. You got anything, Dennison? Yeah, I made a routine check on the possessions of the late Frank Grunner. Found a thing. Oh, what? Passbook. Savings account, Corn Exchange Bank. 
Frankie Boy was a very thrifty character. Salary, commissions, he had a good job. Not this good, Danny. Very few people have it this good. Look, I'll show you. 17th, deposit of 300 simoleons. Mm-hmm. 10th, just a week before that, deposit of two C's plus 50. Third, which is just a week before the 10th, four, six, seven, and 29 cents. Goes on like that. There's something else I got for you, Danny. Well, you're a ball of fire today, aren't you, Dan? Today, yesterday, other days, there have been rumors. That Cora Barker, Danny. Yeah, what about her? I see how well Frank Grunner was doing. Struck me I should check how was Mrs. Cora Barker doing. You know what, chum? Uh, just tell me, huh? Rich girl like Mrs. Barker. Not a savings account to her name. Nowhere in no bank. I figure the married ladies are spendthrift, Danny. You follow me? Mind I use your phone, Danny? Promise to pay, but give Just the turn out the lights and you leave, huh, Dennison? Parker? Yes, of course. You're the policeman who was here when my husband, Eddie, killed that burglar in the library. Please come in. Thanks. Well, I'd like to talk to you. Well, don't you think Eddie should be here? He's just in his room with his gun. Nice collection. I looked at them when I was here. As he spends hours with them. My husband's hobby, guns. I'll call him. Later. Well, uh, how do I entertain you, Mr. Clover? Talk. About what? What possibly could About you and I have? man. Oh, oh no, you're wrong. My husband explained it to me. That wasn't murder. That burglar was robbing our safe, and Eddie shot him. That's not murder. Murder. I'm talking what... about Frank Grunner. Who? A shoe salesman. Oh, I don't. At a lady's shoe shop named Andrea's. Oh. He was murdered. Didn't you read about it? Yes, yes, I did. Want to call your husband now, Mrs. Barker? I told you he's cleaning his guns. He doesn't like to be disturbed. Get him. Very well. Which one? Clover. What does he want? He wants to see you. All right. He says you want to see me. What do you want to see me about? Why did you bring the gun along, Mr. Barker? Well, I was cleaning it. In a few minutes, I'm going to go on cleaning it. Mm. Nice rifle. I like her. Now, what do you want? I want you in on a conversation I was having with your wife. What were you talking about, Cora? He said something about murder, and I explained to him what you explained to me about killing that burglar. And... Yeah, and then we went on to talk about Frank Grunner. What have you got on your mind, Clover? The usual things for a policeman on homicide. Who murdered him? Eddie. What? He's found out I knew Frank Grunner, so he probably thinks I know something about... Listen, Clover, what harm is it for my wife to know a shoe salesman? She told me about him, an ex-con who needed a smile. Now, is that why you're here, to ask my wife about the smile? About the smile, about the lifts home, about Frank Grunner's bank book. What about it? How he was getting rich on a salesman's salary. You're saying what? Mr. Get back to the boy you killed the other night. Just a kid who opened your safe real neat. A kid without a record. Just a wife and a dream and a need for some fast money. A kid. A shipping clerk at a wholesale house. Well, don't get sloppy about it, Clover. Just say it. Shipping clerk. Friend of Frank Grunner. Frank Grunner, friend of your wife. Frank Grunner, man with growing bank account because of your wife. Cora. Listen, Eddie, we talked about it. You said you'd forget it. I like going over it. I like watching what it does to you. Say it slow, Clover. There's not much more. Just slow. Eddie. Your wife ran out of money to give to Frank. She had no bank account of her own. So go out of town. Go to Palm Springs. Her idea. She's a cutie, isn't she? Give Frank the combination of the safe so he could rob it, get more money. Only Frank wouldn't take any chances. Not Frank, for the record. He gave the big opportunity to the boy. Tough about that plane being grounded, wasn't it, Cora? Please, Eddie. And the way you begged me to take a train. Anything to stay away from our house. What about Grunner? Sure, I killed him, too. Him, my wife. Cora told me. I made her tell me. You don't think I'm stupid, do you? How did that boy know the combination of the safe? I didn't tell anyone. Cora must have. What do you want me to do now, Cora? Kill him? Kill you? What? You like guns so much. You like killing so much. Let's have the gun, Parker. 
Watch me, Cora. Kill him. He's scared, Clover. Put it down. He's not scared, honey. He doesn't believe you. He doesn't know you like I do. Oh, well, what am I, honey? After you killed that boy, after the police left, kill Eddie. Do it again. <laughs> a real cutie. Huh? You want a gun, Clover? Catch. How do you feel, Cora? You're crazy. No more. Lock us up, Clover. Put us away. It's an enchanted island, this Broadway, or a desert of dust. Look at it. And it's a magician's pitch with golden mirrors and fountains that plume with jewels. Look at it again, and it's dissolved. And the flakes trail away on the night wind. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Mary Jane Croft, who's heard as Cora, and Edgar Barrier as Eddie Barker. Featured in the cast were James McCallion, Lillian Bayef, Norma Varden, Leo Cleary, and Byron Kane. Bill Anders speaking. Beat has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.